Okay, time is 11 o'clock, so let's get started here. Uh, assignment number two is due on Friday at noon. Uh, my, um, and also the, the midterm is coming up. Uh, it's going to be either March 5th or March 10th. I think we'll be done with the stuff that I want to by March 5th, uh, but um, I don't think there's anybody in this room after us on, on, on Tuesday, so since some students like to have extra time with my tests, um, I think I might uh, make it a Tuesday. Um, on, a, on Thursdays, there is a class that comes in here after us. So I will let you know shortly uh, about that. Uh, the test would just simply be over the Monte Carlo simulation and the bootstrap sections. Okay. Uh, my office hours uh, today are canceled. Uh, sorry about that. If you uh, need to contact me, um, please come come up to my office after class. I'll be happy to meet with you instead, uh, then instead of my normal office hours. Are there any questions before we get started here? Okay. Uh, we left off on the notes on page 49. So we've been talking about two different bootstrap confidence intervals, the, um, the basic and also the student times. And now we're going to talk about the percentile confidence interval and also the BCA interval. Uh, the BCA uh, corrects for some problems with the percentile interval. Uh, the percentile interval is the easiest bootstrap confidence interval to calculate. Also it may be the most used, but that does not necessarily mean that it is the best. In fact, it doesn't mean it's, it's the best. Um, so, so here, here's the, how the uh, percentile interval comes about. So in many places in statistics, we know of where a transformation or statistic um, ends up uh, resulting in a, a better, let's say, distributional approximation. So for example, uh, you know, if you've uh, taken my categorical class, you know that we work with the log odds ratio and actually find a log interval for the, for the log odds ratio because it could be better approximated by a normal distribution than just the odds ratio itself. And we've discussed, you know, that kind of concept here in our class already where some kind of transformation of a statistic might result in a better distribution approximation. The problem, of course, is figuring out, well, what transformation should you use? And so what the percentile interval says, uh, or what the percentile interval does, says, okay, let's just assume that there is some kind of transformation out there that works well. You don't have to specify it, though. It just needs to be a nice, let's say, monotone transformation. And with that, then, we're able to get a confidence interval. This uh, was originally pr uh, proposed by Efron after his initial introduction to bootstrap. Okay, so so, he, so here's some more details. <clears throat> Let's say that we have some transformation of our statistic of interest H, and we're going to call uh, H of T U, just this is a little bit easier. And T, of course, remember is trying to estimate a parameter theta for us in this bootstrap section we can apply the same kind of transformation with theta, so h of theta. We're going to call the resulting parameter then phi. And <clears throat> we're going to assume that this transformation uh, basically um, is, is a monotone invertible transformation so that this phi is at the center of the distribution of u. So in other words, it results in a symmetric transformation for a symmetric distribution, I should say, for u. Okay? So we're just assuming that there's some transformation out there that exists that does this. We're not specifying it exactly. So of course, then that means expected value of u would be phi. We're going to let k then be then the CDF of u minus phi, just like how we've let g uh, denote the CDF of t minus theta.
and we're going to let quantiles from, uh, from the distribution of k be denoted by k inverse. So the alpha of the quantile is k inverse alpha given f. Okay. So <clears throat> with this transformation, then, this is basically what we have. So we get, let's say, u on the x-axis. We have some probability, or the, let's say, like the, the f of u on the, um, on the y-axis. And so what this transformation does, again, it means that it's, uh, you get uh, symmetry. Uh, the distribution of u minus phi uh, is centered at 0, because remember, uh, u is an unbiased estimator than a phi. And, you know, I just drew in there two particular quantiles of interest. Uh, the alpha of the quantile and one minus alpha of the quantile. Now, since this distribution is symmetric, and since I chose alpha in both of those quantile cases, note that the distance, even though it might not necessarily look like this on the plot, the distance from uh, this lower quantile in zero is equal to the distance of the upper quantile in zero. So just like what we see with a normal distribution when we find the 0 0.025 and 0.975 quantiles, which is 1.96, or negative 1.96 and positive 1.96, notice then that if I just take the negative of one of those quantiles, I get the other one back. Okay. So when we were deriving the basic bootstrap confidence interval, we had expressions such as this, where we started off with t minus theta in the middle of a probability statement. And we had uh, a lower quantile on the left side, an upper quantile on the right side, and these quantiles were chosen such that <coughs> the probability of t, uh, of, of t minus theta being between these two quantiles is 1 minus 2 times alpha. We did a little bit of algebra so that we had just alpha, I'm sorry, just a theta in the middle. We took t minus the upper quantile on the left, t minus the lower quantile on the right. Of course, the distribution of g is unknown, because notice we have an f in there. So what we did, we put in an f hat, and then we used Monte Carlo simulation to estimate what those quantiles would be. And so then the lower bound for the interval was t minus then um, a quantile that was obtained through Monte Carlo simulation from our distribution g. That's the lower bound, and for the upper bound we do something very similar, where again, here's my quantile from my, my, from my g, given f hat. So with that as background then, let's find an interval first for phi, the transformed value of our parameter of interest. And so we can use the same ideas as with the basic interval. I have phi in the middle. I have my statistic u minus now the upper quantile for the distribution of k. And then again, I have u minus now the lower quantile for my distribution of k. All this with the probability 1 minus 2 times L. And here, here's, the, here's the big th one of the big things. Remember, this transformation results in a distribution that's symmetric about 0. So what that means then is that I could replace my, my, <laughs> my negative of my 1 minus alpha quantile from my distribution of k. I could replace that now with a negative of, I'm sorry, of, of just, just the, a positive uh, alpha of the quantile. Quantile, I can talk. Again, due to the symmetry. So due to what's basically on the top of page 51. And I can do the similar thing with the upper bound. So I, I, I work with my, my, my lower quantile for the distribution of k. I replace that with a negative of my upper quantile for the distribution of k. Because of the symmetry. Now again, we don't know what the distribution of k is. We don't actually know it. So what we do is we use the bootstrap to try to estimate it. So we replace the f's with f hats. And 
we can use then the Monte Carlo simulation, in other words, taking the resamples and estimate then these quantiles with what you would expect. So the lower quantile will be the U stars, the R plus one times alpha order U star, subtract so off U. And we, again, we do a similar thing then for that upper quantile that we're trying to estimate through Monte Carlo simulation. Now, look what happens to the lower bound if if essentially what we were, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, now look what happens to this lower bound. So let me get this all on one page here. Okay. So for my lower bound here, I take my observed statistic now, plus then this lower quantile. And I estimate that again through using the bootstrap. Look what happens. U cancels out. And here is my lower bound then for the interval. The R plus 1 times alpha of order U star. I do a similar thing with the upper bound. Again, I take U plus then that 1 minus alpha of quantile. I estimate that with the bootstrap. My U's cancel out. And I'm left with an upper bound. That's the R plus 1 times 1 minus alpha of um, uh, ordered value of the U stars. Okay, now here's another big part here. H of t is a monotone transformation. So that means then the ordering amongst the U stars, I'm sorry, the, the ordering, you know, we want really an uh, a, a, a interval for theta. So the ordering amongst T stars is not going to change if, if I were to apply that transformation. So because of that then, all I need to do is use the inverse transformation with these two bounds from the U stars. And this then, finally, is my percentile interval for theta. That's it. So why is it called a percentile interval? Well, essentially, you know, if you, let's say, looked at a histogram, of your distribution of T star, you know, suppose the distribution looks like this, you know, it's like saying, okay, I want to find the value here such that 0.025 uh, or, or let's say 2.5% of all the other, of all my T stars are less than that. And then I find the value here such that 2.5% of my T stars are greater than that. So I'm essentially just pulling off quantiles from my, my, so from my simulated distribution for, for T star, and that's it for my interval. That's it. There's no other thing that you're doing. And so you can see how simple this interval is to calculate. Okay. <clears throat> Are there any questions about how this percentile interval comes out, comes about? Because a, a short answer question I've used before on, on tests where I evaluate students' understanding of the bootstrap is just to uh, tell me, you know, how is the interval derived? This is how it's derived. Any questions? Again, the key components, a symmetric monotone transformation of T. Use the bootstrap, I'm sorry, use the basic interval. Take advantage of the sym symmetry property, and then take advantage of the fact that it's a monotone transformation to get back to the T's. The T's. That's it. So, it's, it's very, very easy, and you can see why it's so appealing for, uh, for people to use this. It's intuitive, easy to calculate. <clears throat> so also, just to make sure you see this, notice how I'm looking at, let's say, essentially the, the lower quantile from my distribution of T star, or um, uh, as the lower bound, and then the upper quantile as my upper bound, which again was reverse of what we had with the basic interval. <coughs> okay, so this percentile interval, <coughs> sorry, so that with this percentile interval, uh, it produces limits that are always within the parameter space, provided a sensible statistic is chosen. Meaning that if you know that your statistic 
or if you know your parameter is always going to be positive, don't choose a, a statistic that could be negative. That's what I mean by sensible statistic, okay? So why then is the percentile interval going to produce limits that are always within the parameter space? Maybe I just kind of gave it away by explaining what sensible means. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if, if 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 you know, let's say that T star is always positive, and your parameter is always positive. Well, okay, mm -hmm. you're, you're not going to have any problems because you're always finding quantiles from the actual distribution of T star, and that's it. Now let's compare this to what the basic interval does. So here's a little drawing that I made once when I was teaching a bootstrap course. It was such a beautiful looking drawing. I thought, why don't I just copy and paste the drawing here? I should show this to my five-year-old son. I, I think he would appreciate it. <laughs> All the pretty colors. Uh, okay, so the, basi uh, the basic confidence interval is shown above. Okay, uh, and and here I have some kind of distribution shown, uh, drawn. And obviously, it's drawn as a continuous distribution. That, that's okay. Just you can imagine it as a histogram, and you put a little line on top of the bars of the histogram so that you can better see it. Okay, and then I took away the bars. Um, so, you know, our, our statistic of interest, you know, probably would, and let me, let me get a different color here. Oh, let's see here. Let's do green. So, here is where my statistic would fall. You know, somewhere in the middle. And remember what the percentile interval does. It just simply picks off two quantiles from the distribution of T star. That's it. So. Here's one of the quantiles, here's the other quantile. Now look what the basic interval does. It finds the distance that, that, that the upper quantile of the from the distribution, it finds that distance to t. So in other words, it's this right here, this distance that's in blue. Okay. And then what it does then, it says, okay, let's start at t and subtract off that distance. Well, look what happens then when I subtract off that same distance, that blue. I get a lower limit, and you know, perhaps here's zero, let's say. I get a lower limit that's you know, outside the range of the, the actual distribution itself. And you know, if you had limitations of where the parameter could only be positive, think of this as maybe as a gamma distribution you can see how that lower limit for the basic interval could actually be outside your parameter space. Also, here's a question for you. Which interval is going to be longer, the basic or the percentile? Or will they be the same? Take a look at my beautiful blue and yellow colors. So the upper bound, look, look how the upper bound of the basic confidence interval is formed. Look at that distance there in, in, in terms of the actual distribution. So are, are, is the basic and percentile, are they, is one of them going to be longer than the other or are they going to be always the same length? Always going to be the same length. Okay. At least this was meant when I drew this, so that you, know, you would see that, okay, well, here's where the percentile interval is. You got the yellow, and you have the blue. And what we're doing with the basic interval is we're just kind of reversing stuff, blue, yellow. And it's meant to be drawn so that those blue and the yellow parts on the, these two levels are exactly the same. Like, so <clears throat> one reason why I always like to bring this up is because when I was taking a corresponding bootstrap course, I was showing uh, my uh, my professor some of the cool stuff I was doing, and and in it was the percentile interval, basic interval, and he noticed that they weren't the same length. He said, "Okay, you must have a computational error here." So there's a good way to check to see if you're doing it right. The two intervals have to be the same length.
So what about the studentized interval? Do you think the studentized interval will always produce limits that are within the parameter space? The answer is no. You're, you're not guaranteed it. And, and it all comes down again to look at, this, at, at how it's formed. Um, and, you know, you're taking t minus you know, that z star quantile times some, some um, standard deviation. And, uh, you know, you know think, think back to other times where you've done those kinds of intervals, where you take the statistic minus a quantile times the standard deviation. There are many intervals that you probably have encountered in the past where, you know, you were outside the parameter space. So, for example, for those of you who took my study at 75 class, you know a confidence interval for the probability of success, what we call pi. That walled confidence interval could be outside the parameter space. Okay, so let's take a look at an example of how to do these calculations. Um, not too difficult, as you might expect. So, let's say this is with the AC data once again. I've stored my results into, in boot.res. I just specify with the boot.ci function, 95% uh, confidence, the type of interval that I want, uh, perk or percentile. Um, and we get the output here. Uh, note, uh, I, when I was copying and pasting, unfortunately, I also <laughs> ran the code with the basic at the same time. So I would just delete this and also delete this right here because notice I don't include the basic up there. If I wanted to include the basic, I would just use the combined function to combine basic and, and perp into a vector. And we see the percentile intervals 46.6 to 192.9. Uh, you know, the nice thing about, uh, about doing this, uh, with my mistake here, is that you can actually then compare it to the basic interval as well. And you can see how the percentile interval is essentially shifted up in comparison to the basic. If you were to do this without the uh, boot.ci function, uh, please note the, the small little change there as well. I could just take boot.res dollar sign t, uh, find the, uh, the first column because that contains all my t stars. Uh, sp specify uh, type equal one for the type of quantile I want. My probs corresponds to uh, what will be 0.025 and 0.975, and of course you get exactly the same interval. Okay. So that's the percentile interval. Again, it's easy, but it's not necessarily the best. Um, if I would ever see anybody use a percentile interval in a paper, or if they were given a seminar, and they didn't give justification for why they did that, I would immediately ask, why did you do that when you know that there are better intervals out there? And so Efron saw that, yeah, this interval is not working as well as what we would like. And so in the late 1980s, he published a, a paper in JAZZA called Better Bootstrap Confidence Intervals. And one of them that he proposed was called the BCA interval. This stands for Bias Corrected Accelerated. Why the A has to be in the subscript for BC, I have no idea. <laughs> Why not just call it BCA? Or, you know, with capital letters, BCA. No. Why, why do we need the, the subscript? Oh, well. I guess when you're Efron, <coughs> you can do what you want. Uh, so, basically, what this is trying to do is uh, get around some of the problems with the percentile interval. You know, we basically had to make the assumption that there was some monotone transformation out there that was symmetric, okay? Well, that's nice, and, and I think it's, you know, really remarkable that we can assume that something exists without ever actually specifying exactly what that transformation should be. But, you know, it doesn't guarantee, though, that there's actually some kind of transformation out there that doesn't. And so what this tries to do, this BC interval, is it tries to get around that. And so, you know, maybe, for example, H of T is not an unbiased estimate of H of theta. 
you know, e even in the case where, let's say, if t was an unbiased estimate of theta, you're not guaranteed that h of t would be an unbiased estimate of, of h of theta. That's, you're not guaranteed that. And so there's a little correction that tries to take that into account. Also, we've talked about uh, specific situations in the past where if, if a variance of a statistic, if it's dependent upon a parameter, we know that that can cause issues uh, in terms of, you know, your interval might not perform as well. Because the variability, that's another thing that you have to worry about. And we saw that specifically with the basic confidence interval. Um, and so even h of t minus h of theta, might, that variance might still be a function of theta itself. And so what, what um, Efron came up with was a way maybe to try to handle that, if, if that were to occur. And so the bias corrected part of the name corresponds to this. The acceleration part corresponds to that. And actually what it does, it does a correction for skewness of the distribution of the t. Okay. So rather than, you know, in, in, in the, in the um, uh, percentile interval, we were looking for the r plus 1 times alpha order quantile from t star. And also the r plus 1 times 1 minus alpha quantile from t star. Okay. We're essentially going to do the same thing here, except we are going to replace alpha with what I'm going to call alpha tilde low. And we're going to replace 1 minus alpha with what I call alpha tilde up. So, you know, in a 95% in, in confidence interval with a percentile interval, we simply look at the 0 0.025 and the 0.975 quantiles from T star. Here, what we might actually do is find the 0 0.01 quantile from T star for the lower bound, and maybe the 0.93 quantile from the distribution of T star, depending upon what this alpha tilde up and alpha tilde low actually are. Okay, so this is what the actual calculation of these alpha tildes looks like. So alpha tilde low ends up being um, a, uh, essentially a, a, um, well, a number between 0 and 1. I don't necessarily want to call it probability. A number between 0 and 1 where you use the CDF of a standard normal. So that's often common notation that people use. They use an uppercase V to mean the CDF of the standard normal. So if I put, let's say, 0.5 in there. Suppose I put 0.5 in here for um, a standard nor uh, for CDF of the standard normal, what would be the end result? V of 0.5 is? Zero. Yeah, because of course the distribution is symmetric about zero. But we don't put 0.5 in there. Instead we put this stuff. Okay. The W is what's helping to correct for bias. So what this is is essentially you look at your distribution of all your T stars that you've gotten from resampling, and you find the location of T. So if T was like right in the middle of that distribution, such that let's say 50% of the T star values would be to the left, 50% would be to the right, basically this W ends up being zero. No corrections needed. You know, think of a, in, in terms of a normal distribution. The median of the normal of a standard normal is zero. Okay, so if you take a sample and you observe that your sample median is zero, okay, well that there's no necessary correction that needs to be made. And so we look at the number of t stars that are less than or equal to t. Divide that by r plus one. And again, what this is going to give us is essentially a proportion. What proportion are less than or equal to t? We put that proportion then in the inverse CDF of a standard normal. So again, if, I, if, uh, if T was exactly the median of your T star distribution, what would happen to this? It would be equal to 
Well, this would be 0.5. The inverse of a CDF of a standard normal evaluated at 0.5 is? Zero. Okay. So we can see that if T's right in the middle there, don't, W is zero. There's no, no bias correct, uh, correction at all. Now, A is a little bit harder, harder to see where it comes from. So this is what A looks like. A stands for acceleration. It's a, some constant. Um, and I'm sorry, I should have put this out. So you notice here's W, here's W, here's W. And then also we see A in one spot. Okay? So this A is equal to 1 6 times the uh, empirical influence values cubed divided by the empirical influence values squared, that whole quantity there, raised to the 3 divided by 2 power. Okay. Now you might be wondering, where does that come from? Well, take a look at, you know, you can go back to Kessel and Berger and do this. Look at the, um, the standardized skewness coefficient. Okay. In terms of written, in terms of expected values. And you're going to see some very similar uh, aspects to that. That's where that comes from. Also in this expression for alpha tilde low, you notice you have a z sub alpha. And what that means is what you expect. It's the alpha the quantile from a standard normal. Okay, so I have a, a big y. <laughs> well, this was one of the places where I decided to cut uh, in comparison to my set 950 course. Um, where I would talk more details about the derivation. So you're not responsible for the derivation here, rather just responsible for the application and the intuitiveness be behind some of the aspects here. You know, that we want to correct for bias, we want to correct for uh, what ends up being skewness. Okay? Uh, I do give a, l a little bit more of an explanation here. Um, uh, because it, it kind of just gives you some, um, some background about how the derivation of this, uh, of this interval comes about. It's simply what, um, what uh, Efron said, okay, first of all, to correct for bias, why don't we just take h of t minus h of theta to be approximated by a normal, where if, if it was unbiased, notice you would have a zero here, but if it's biased, well then you have something else there. So he said, let's call it negative w. And, and through that, he, he derived what was called the bias corrected interval first in his paper. And then he added an additional aspect in his paper. He said, okay, well, maybe I have to also worry about the variance. So instead of the variance being constant, maybe I could take the variance to be sigma squared of phi, so some function of phi. And this sigma of phi is 1 plus a of phi. And so notice how phi is inside the variance. So that shows you how even after this transformation, the h of t, its variance, is still a function of the parameter itself. How much is it a function of the parameter? That's where the a comes in. So notice if a is zero, eh, you don't have to worry about anything now. But if a is something other than zero, now uh, this variance is still a function of phi and you get some issues. And so what he did was derive uh, uh, what A should be to help correct for uh, these issues that occur. So let's actually go back up to the formula itself again. Uh, I want to point out one more thing. Okay. So you can, if you can get a little in trouble here if you're not uh, paying close attention. And that is, so for the lower bound of this interval, notice I have alpha tilde low. Again. This is alpha tilde low. Notice I'm using the alpha th quantile with that standard normal part. For alpha tilde up, that's a different value. It's not 1 minus alpha tilde low. Again, it's not 1 minus alpha tilde low. You might be tempted to do that. I've been tempted to do that when I was first learning this, but it's not. 
And so you can see then the difference between alpha tilde low and alpha tilde up. Alpha tilde up uses the one minus alpha quantile from, from the distant, from uh, the same angle. Now, you might be thinking, okay, so you're using the normal distribution here, essentially in the derivation. Are, are, and so that means then, you know, you're, you're, you're assuming normality. Well, no, we're not. Uh, we're not ever saying y is distributed normal. We're just essentially using some approximations here to help us come up with some corrections. That's all. Um, and again, notice we're not necessarily specifying the actual transformation itself. That's what's really so cool about it. You're not specifying, oh, I want to use a log transformation. You're not specifying that. Now, the boot.ci function um, makes a, is a, uses a slightly different value of w than what we um, uh, will use. Um, but it's okay, just, just use boot.ci, even though it's using a slightly different value. Instead of having an R in the denominator of this part of the, the expression, it uses, um, I'm sorry, instead of having R plus one, it just uses R. I find that kind of surprising considering that boot.ci was written for the, Dave, um, was one of the functions that was, that was written for the Davidson and Hinckley book. And Davidson and Hinckley use R plus one throughout, but for some reason boot.ci just uses R. Again, if R is large, it's gonna make a difference. Go ahead and just use boot.ci as is. You don't have to make any kind of correction for it. Uh, let's see now. So for the calculation of A, so again, you know, uh, a thing that I did cut from, from teaching a whole semester of the, of the bootstrap was we don't ever actually calculate the empirical influence values here in our class. Instead, we use an approximation to it. It's totally fine to do that. Um, uh, and so, so instead of using just the L, we're going to use L jack in its calculation. And so we will actually use A jack. Now, what boot.ci actually does, it doesn't use the actual empirical influence values. It does not use the jackknife to estimate A. Instead, you may remember on page 34 of my notes that, um, just a second here, a little small change I want to make. It's just to be totally consistent. It should be a boot 1.34, not just boot.34. Um, you might remember I told you that there was a way to use the bootstrap to estimate these empirical influence values. Well, since essentially you're passing all the resamples into boot.ci, boot.ci says, okay, I'll just use those to estimate the empirical influence values uh, unless you tell me otherwise. So, and that's fine. You, 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 can, you, can, you, you can just go with the default and use that. Um, I do my, I think it's my, my AC, uh, the air conditioning, uh, program uh, for, for the air conditioning example. I think I do show you an example of how to use the, um, uh, the bootstrap uh, to estimate the empirical influence values. Take a look at that if you're just so you're not responsible for it though. Okay, so also something you have to be careful about <coughs> is what, what, what happens, so you know if you're getting a 95% interval, again we've always in the past, always got, let's say, the 0 0.025 quantile and a 0.975 quantile from some distribution. Here, though, we're changing which quantile that we want. And depending upon what the BCA interval comes up for, this corrections, for these corrections, this alpha tilde, perhaps it might be 0.00001. Okay? And if you have uh, 4,999 resamples, 
and you're looking for essentially the point zero 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 one quantile from your T stars, well, essentially what you're doing is you're taking the, the lowest, you'll have to take the lowest value of all the T stars that you got in your resamples. And we do know that, you know, the farther you get out in that distribution, probably the, the, uh, the worse the quality that estimate will be. And so that can be an issue with the BCA interval. In particular, where this comes up is when the distribution of T star is, let's say, really, really skewed. Okay. So, you know, what, what is a fix to this problem? Well, if you see this coming up and actually boot.ci will, will tell you, hey, watch out, you are taking some very extreme order, uh, essentially order statistics from the distribution of T star. You're taking some very extreme values there. Uh, watch out. <laughs> um, so what could you do instead? Well, maybe take a larger R. Rerun it, use a larger R. That's a simple fix that can be done. It might not always work in every situation, but that is one thing that you can do. Otherwise, you know, then you might just have to live with it or explore alternative confidence interval methods. So as I've said a number of times now, the BCA and the studentized intervals are the best bootstrap confidence interval methods. These should be the only ones that you use in practice. Now again, why do we talk about the basic and, and the percentile interval? Is it to waste your time? No. But you notice that you know, we needed to know those intervals to have an idea of where these, where these better intervals are coming from. So that's why we do that. Uh, so these questions, we have essentially uh, already discussed those. And on page 58, are the limits for the BCA interval always in the parameter space for a sensibly chosen statistic? The answer is everyone at once. Yes, it is. For the same reason as with the percentile. Okay, so let's talk about how we can do some of these calculations. So again, this is with the AC data. Um, so again, I've already uh, took my resamples in boot.res to do the BCA interval with boot.ci. I just simply say type equal uh, quote BCA. And I get 56.7 to 227.0. We will do some comparisons of, the, of all the intervals that we've calculated uh, shortly. If I were to do this by hand, essentially, uh, with the help of a little bit of the computer, how would I do it? Well, you know, just simply find your LJX. Again, how do we do that in the past? We use the EMPIF function to automatically do that for us. It's so nice that that uh, uh, allows us to do that. And then to find AJAC, we just simply plug in the AJAC um, ex expression. So 1 6 times the sum of the LJAX cubed divided by the sum of the LJAX squared, that bottom quantity there raised to the 3 halves power. Then let's, let's correct for the, um, uh, the potential bias. So what do we do? We look at all the T stars and we count how many of them are less than T itself. We sum up, or, or I guess we count it, and then we divide by R plus 1 so that we get a, a, a reasonable estimate of where we're at. And so notice there's 53% or 54% of your T stars are less than T. So, you know, I wouldn't necessarily expect too, too severe of a cor correction for the bias here. And to emphasize the point that if I were just to dry, uh, divide by R instead, you can see there is not much difference at all. Move this out of the way. Okay. So then uh, to, to do this calculation uh, for W, I use the Q norm function. So remember, I'm um, essentially needing a quantile for my Q-norm function. Again, if I were to have Q-norm P equal 0.5 there, you can see that W will be 0, and there will be no correction at all. Here in this particular case, W ends up being 0 0.09. Uh, let's say that I want to get a 95% interval, so I'm going to let my 
two values of alpha be 0 0.025 and 0 0.975. Now in my expression for the interval itself, notice that I need in two places w plus z sub alpha. So what I'm going to do is call, call that z tilde. So I say z tilde is w plus q norm of uh, p equal alpha. And I get negative 1.54. Note that if w was 0, what would we get? negative 1.64. So we can see that the, the, the bias correction there, how it's making a little bit of change. Then with the z tildes, um, I take w plus the z tilde divided by 1 minus a jack times z tilde, and that's going to be my alpha tilde with, when I use the p norm function. p norm allows me to get my standard normal CDF. And so alpha tilde ends up being 0 0.12. Let me just double check that. Yeah. So you can see that there was some correction that occurred uh, in terms of, let's take a look at a jack. A jack was 0.14. So that means then I need to find the r plus 1 times alpha tilde um, a value uh, from my distribution of T star. That order, let's see that? I must have did something wrong here. Hold on. Because it's not matching the, the notes. There we go. Now, I thought that was odd. So alpha dot tilde was 0 0.08. And I'm still not matching the notes, am I? Let's actually rerun all of this. We don't have values for all. We don't have here. Do we? Do we? No. In the notes, you didn't like print out. Oh, I, I know. I, I, I understand. Yeah. I didn't necessarily print it out. I was just. I what I want to match is uh, on page fifty-eight where you see what D is. That's oh, okay. three forty-one, mm -hmm. and so I was just giving you some extra details. So more, you know, more, more for your money today. Let's see here. I was doing some other bootstrapping before class, so that's probably why I am uh, using some other boot.res for some other problem that I was working on. I have a feeling. Let's make sure that I'm getting the right interval here. 56.7 to 27.0, okay. W, mm -hmm. W matches, mm -hmm. and D matches too. So alpha dot tilde is 0 0.068. That's what I was saying, because I didn't think there was such a s huge correction there, because after all, what we were getting for W uh, was not, not that big, and even for, uh, for the, the A. So, <coughs> excuse me, let's see here. So also, you know, in these calculations, I simultaneously put the 0.975 in there uh, for alpha. So to get my upper bound then, all these calculations uh, carry forward. And notice for my upper bound, I need the 4,979th order value. So before, with the percentile interval, we would have done r plus 1 times alpha. I would have searched for the 125th and 4,875th ordered values before. And now you can just simply see uh, with, with the upper bound here, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a bigger uh, correction. Well, why is this happening? Well, remember that distribution for the T stars was uh, somewhat skewed, um, in, in uh, right skewed, that is. And that's why that, that's happening there.
Okay. So continuing then doing this by hand, notice that it says the 341.5 tooth ordered value. Well, of course you can't have that. So either take the 341 or the 342. If you wanted to be really precise, and this is what the BCA interval does, it does some interpolation between the 341 and 342. Okay. And so here, just to show you what would happen, I, I use the ceiling function and also use the floor function with D uh, to show you what the limits are. And in the end, due to the discreteness that comes about through using the bootstrap, notice that uh, I essentially get the same values for if I'm using the ceiling or floor. Okay, and so anyway, so there, there's how you calculate your interval if you were to do it without boot.ci. Uh, now this interval will be is slightly different than what you see for boot.ci because remember how it's calculating A is different from what, um, what we are doing. Okay, so that takes us to page 59. Um, first of all, are there any questions? Okay, so some additional aspects of using uh, boot.ci that I want to briefly mention. Um, it also cal so it calculates the four intervals that we talked about and it also does one more. And it simply calls it the normal interval. And all that means is this. You know, let's say you did use a normal approximation for the distribution of your statistic of interest. Okay, so in the interval itself, it just simply takes the one minus alpha quantile from the standard normal and also the alpha quantile. For the variance, it puts in uh, basically the bootstrap estimate, as we've talked about before, and also it includes a bias correction. So in the boot.ci function, again, you will see an interval called normal. That's what it's doing there. Do we really ever have a reason to calculate it? No, unless you don't really know anything about the bootstrap. And you can say, well, yeah, I use a bootstrap variance. Okay, well, that's great. but. Uh, um, you know, use some of one of the other bootstrap intervals. Uh, you know, to some respect, this is a kind of a comparison tool. Um, so, let's see here. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Now, also with the boot.ci function, uh, and we've talked about this before, you can actually specify a particular transformation use of your statistic. Um, and you can specify that actually in the boot.ci function, it will all automatically do all the calculations for you associated with you know, finding the interval, let's say, on the h of t scale, and then transforming back to the h of, uh, uh, transforming back to the, uh, the t scale itself, you can say. Uh, and I'll show you how to, how to do that shortly. Okay, so with the air conditioning data, once again, you can use a type equal all for with boot.ci to get all the uh, five confidence intervals calculated. And so here's all five. And we can see the one that's new to us is this normal uh, interval. Um, let's see. And you know, overall, you know, you can see obviously some some differences amongst them. Um, you know, it's it's interesting that the uh, the one that ones that are the widest are the BCA and the student ties. Remember how I said that those are the best. Again, you can see the relationship between the basic and the percentile there as as well. If you were to actually go through some, let's say, by hand calculations with the normal interval, well, I show you how to do that there. Uh, this B was calculated by us earlier as the bias correction. Okay, well let's talk about now using a variance stabilizing transformation uh, so that maybe we can get a better basic interval and also a better student ties interval. Uh, I did present to you in the past the, the corresponding expressions and maybe I should have just copied them down here. Sorry about that. So, let's see. So, for example, with the with the student ties interval, this is what we're finding for z: h of t minus h of theta 
divided by the absolute value of the first uh, derivative of h of t times the square root of v, where v would be the normal variance that you would calculate for, for t itself. That's what we're calculating. There it is in terms of the z stars. And then to find the actual confidence interval itself, um, you know, if we have a monotone transformation, we can, uh, that's, it's invertible. Uh, this is how we're actually calculating the interval. Um, Boot.ci allows you to do this essentially automatically. If you specify functions that allow you to do the transformation of T, that allows you to do the, the inverse transformation, and also allows you to get the first derivative. So let's take a look at how to do this. First of all, the question is, again, well, what do you use for a transformation? And again, as we talked about with the percentile BCA interval, you know, those intervals you don't have to specify with one. So that's why they're nice. But let's say that we did want to specify, and that can be helpful with student ties, obviously. Well, what should you use? Well, previously we talked about how, you know, it might be reasonable for y to be distributed exponentially. You know, we looked at some plots that you know, made it seem like, yeah, that seems reasonable. And then using what you learned in, in, in set 883, um, you can derive the distribution of t, which again is a sample mean. It's a gamma distribution with uh, the alpha parameter of n and the beta parameter of mu divided by n. Okay, there's a nice theorem in Selenberger's book that actually look at, looks at that using the moment generating function. Now what this means, well, since I know the distribution of t, if this is really true, I know the distribution of t, and of course just using the expression for where the variance of a gamma distribution is, I get mu squared divided by m. Okay. Well, let's look at a log transformation, see where that gets us. So let's say that instead of working with t, I'm going to work with log of t. So essentially my h of t, the h is the log transformation. And then I can use the delta method to find, well, what will be the variance of log of t? Is everyone comfortable when I say we can use the delta method to do that? Uh, silence means yes. So what you would do in that case, you take your original variance, variance of t, and then you take the derivative with respect to mu of h of your parameter of interest, and you square it. And look what happens. Yay, I get 1 over n. Notice my mu's disappear. I have found a variance stabilizing transformation. Was it magic? No. How did I know to pick that? Well, you work in the opposite direction. So what ends up happening is this. You can verify this on your own. That the transformation that you want is always the integral of some constant doesn't matter what it is, people usually just take it to be one, of the square root uh, of, the, of uh, the constant divided by the square root of the variance of t, d mu. Do that integral, and you will find that the log transformation is the correct one to use. Okay, so now that we've found the log transformation, now we can use boot.ci. So in boot.ci itself, I have my, my resamples. If you remember when we were using the student ties interval, uh, we put the results in boot.res2 because we also had to calculate the variance for every single resample. And so that's what boot.res2 re represents rather than just boot.res. 95% confidence. The type of interval I want, somehow for some reason I lost a parentheses there. Not that, that big of a deal. And then, I have three new arguments here. The first one is h. This is where you can write your own function that will automatically do the transformation of your statistic. Here, of course, R already has a function called log that does my natural log transformation. So that's why I just put log there. h inverse. Well, what's the, inv when, what's the inverse of a log transformation? Well, the exponential function. So. There happens to be a function r called exp that gives it to me. If there wasn't, then I could actually write my own function and put it in there. And then lastly, h dot, that corresponds to the, the first derivative 
of your H function. I wrote my own function just to show you how it would work. So I said H dot dot func for the lack of a better name. My function, I'm going to pass in something to it. I don't have to call it U. I could call it something else. And then I just simply take, well, 1 over U. Now, how else could you have done this? Um, what would be a function that you could use for H dot that's already in R? I haven't tried this, but I bet you could use the solve function because that solve allows you to find the inverse of matrices. So that's kind of overkill to put the solve function there. So that's why I just wrote my own function. Do note though, I had not tried that. So maybe there's something that I've missed that you know um, R wouldn't like it. So I put the results into save.tran.ci. Um, and this is what I get now for my new intervals. Okay. And the main thing here is for us to be able to do the comparisons. Let's, let's take a look at these. Come on, word work for me. There we go. Okay. Now notice with these transformations here how it's basically taking the studentized interval and the original basic interval that we had and it's making them closer to the BCA interval. Or let me restate that, excuse me. Take a look at the basic interval with the transformation. It's making it closer to the BCA interval in comparison to what it was before. The studentized interval here, without the transformation, compare it to with the transformation. You can see it's not really making that much of a difference. Why? Well, remember how the studentized interval is essentially trying to work out. You know, it's find the studentized quantity that's hopefully at least somewhat approximately pivotal to begin with. So trying to correct for still additional issues that might exist, well, if they, if they don't really exist anymore after that correction, you're not going to have much of a correction. You know, the basic, the percentile, and all the, nor and, and the normal intervals, you can see that those are quite different from the other three intervals because they typically will perform the worst of, of those six. So anyway, it's, it's just a interesting to do the comparisons there and that, you know, especially after this transformation, which you hope will improve things, um, you know, we are getting intervals that are, are, are more similar to what we know is, is already good. So speaking of things that we know that are already good, well, why do we know that they're already good? Well, you know, one could do some mathematical argument that as n goes to infinity, um, you can see that, for example, the studentized mm -hmm. interval and the BCA interval are actually at a, a um, um, you could say, a, a, what, what's often referred to as second order level of, co of convergence than uh, like the percentile or the uh, basic interval. What that basically means is that the, and I know I didn't put this in the notes, but I think it's okay for us to talk about, you can actually do asymptotic exp expansions of the confidence interval limits of, of one of these intervals. And you could s actually see as a function of n that for the BCA and student ties, you are going to get to the correct spot faster with those intervals than with the basic and also the percentile intervals. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about it, take a look at chapter 5 of Davidson and Hinckley's book. Now, of course, you know, um, <coughs> excuse me. Now, another way to do this is to look at Monte Carlo's simulation. And so that's what we're going to do this, to actually allow you to see why you know, one interval is better than the other. And essentially, we've kind of already did this, but I think now it's a good time to go back to the Monte Carlo simulation section and just briefly, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, unfortunately of course I closed out my notes for some reason, uh, I want to just spend a little bit of time, now that you know what these bootstrap intervals are, I just want to spend a little bit of time looking at those plots again.
Mass hell. Take me back to where I was before. Okay. A little bit bigger. Twenty. Yeah, I think that's good enough. So again, you know what we saw previously was again, uh, and let's not even worry about the normal base here or the asymptotic. Let's just focus on the bootstrap intervals itself. And we saw how this was a con again the simulations were finding a confidence interval for sigma squared. And we saw previously how uh, the student ties, you know, again, was almost, almost always on the mark. Or if it wasn't, you can see that it's getting there pretty quickly in comparison to the other ones. Uh, this, these are for true confidence levels. Uh, you know, of course, then the problem with then the student ties interval was its length. And so we looked at these estimated expected length plots, and you can see with the student ties, that, you know, especially if you have a really skewed distribution, your estimated expected length is just huge in comparison to the rest. So while you might have good true confidence level properties, its length is not necessarily the good, that good. With the BCA interval, we saw that that interval was actually the best of all of, 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 of the other three intervals. So for example, well, let me do some erasing here because it's just a big mess. So if we take a look at, oh, we'll do the logistic. So here's BCA, and we can see how eventually at sample size of 100, it's getting where, where we want it to be. But with the basic interval, you can see how you're kind of shifted down, and also the percentile you're shifted down. You know, especially when you're comparing BCA to percentile, it should make sense that BCA is always going to be better because the BCA is trying to correct for problems with the percentile. If we uh, take a look at then the, the ex estimated expected lengths, once again, now you know because of the student ties interval there, you know being so large, it distorts the plot. So if you remember, I also did another plot uh, where I cut off the uh, this number at 20, and we can see again for the logistic. So here's my estimated expected lengths. Compare that to basic. Compare that to percentile. And so we can see that the, the BCA intervals will, tends to be a little bit longer. And so, you know, how, why is it performing better? It's because it's a little bit longer in comparison to the other two intervals. And so again, if I had to pick an interval to use, I would be okay with the student ties as long as I have a sufficient sample size. But I, I think the BCA would be a, 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 not necessarily a, a bad other choice. But I think in every case you need to make sure that you have a good enough sample size to get a good enough interval for practical use. Okay, move that. So how would I do then these simulations if I include then the bootstrap stuff um, in these simulations? I'm just gonna go over the, some, some big picture things here. Um, so what I did was I copied some code directly from TIN uh, so that I could bring the actual uh, formatting over to Word here. And so just like what we've done before, I simulate my data, uh, sample size of nine I'm going to use only, 500 simulated data sets. I'm going to simulate all my data at once. Now to do this Monte Carlo simulation then, what you need to do is still have your calc.t function Actually, let's actually go down here first. So to actually do the, the confidence interval calculations, I still use my sim.func that we saw back in the Monte Carlo simulation section. I've added a default for my number of resamples. I decided to make it 1,999. Here's where I calculate my normal and asymptotic intervals. To do the bootstrap intervals, I have to call the bootstrap, uh, boot function. Now remember, since we're doing for 500 simulated data sets, we're going to have to take 1,999 resamples per data set. 
So think about how many, let's say, samples overall that you're taking. Well, 500 times 1,999. If I take a look at calc.t, notice in the calc.t, of course, I have to calculate my LJX. Again, for each of those, I'm doing the jackknife. So for each resample, I need to take essentially nine additional samples. So you can see how this, you know, whenever you're including the bootstrap in a Monte Carlo simulation set, uh, setting, you're really, um, um, uh, you know, increasing the number of overall samples and thus also potentially the overall time that you're going to need to use. So then with the boot function itself, I'm sorry, with the boot.ci function itself, I say type equal all to get all of my intervals. And something that's new that you haven't seen before is that when I put the results in an object called save.int, I can actually pull out my individual intervals. So for example, for the basic interval, it's the basic component of save.int. Uh, the fourth value gives me my lower bound. The fifth value gives me my upper bound. You should take a look at on your own what one, and one through three give you. Uh, basically, it's the actual uh, uh, ordered value. Um, well, I guess it depends upon the interval itself. So, for example, with um, BCA, uh, it, it will actually give you what, let's say, R times alpha, uh, I'm sorry, R plus one times alpha tilde low, what that value is, it gives it to you. That will be important shortly. Um, so, I do my simulation. Uh, first of all, I time it with just 10 data sets to see how long it would take me. It estimates it to be 11 minutes to do all my simulations. In the end, it ended up being 13 and a half minutes on my computer, which is a lot longer than what it took previously. But notice this, 19 warnings that I got when I was doing this. So, you know, what does it say to do? Well, use warnings to see them. And this is what I get. So what does this mean? Unfortunately, we're running run out of time. Real briefly, what this means is that my, with my BCA interval, it's taking some extreme quantiles. Of course, by what I was talking about about 20 minutes ago. OK. How did I know that? Well, I actually had to, you know, you know, you know why is this occurring here? Why norm.enter? So what I had to actually do was look at the boot.ci function itself. I went into the code. I saw in the code it was calling individual functions for each of the intervals. In particular, there was a function called bca.ci. I looked inside that function, and what do you know? I found a norm.enter which stands for interpolate. I found that function in there. Did a little bit more investigation in my actual code. Let's see, did I copy that? Oh, I unfortunately deleted it out. Well, anyway, if you take a look at my actual function itself, you will see me, I, I add a, a little segment there that allows me to actually pull out what those ordered, uh, the, uh, the, the ordered uh, numbers are. In other words, the r plus one times alpha tilde low. And then it allows me to see that, yes, indeed, what's happening is that these extreme order values are happening with the BCA interval. Again, what could you do? Take a larger number of resamples. But remember, you have 500 simulated data sets here. You could do that. That's probably what I would do in practice. Instead, I just left it as is. OK, we are out of time. Are there any questions? OK, and that's it for today.